told we can adjust these things so people can hear us, so FYI. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, uh, this may sound like something a little bit different, regenerative ag, but uh, uh, there's a pretty profound uh, decentralization component to this and a decentralized protocol component to this. Um, so before we get started, um, uh, disclosure, uh, I know these people. Um, these people know these people, um, and uh, uh, my brother uh, had some issues with his land, and uh, and he um, um, sought out ways to heal his land, essentially. So he was connected with Rob, and uh, um, the rest of the story unfolded in the creation of a company called Fifth World. Um, Mark Ziad, uh, Ziadi, um, was uh, a stellar contributor at Consensus and has done a bunch of things in his career um, and uh, and talked to him about this and he, he was excited to join. So we know each other. Um, uh, so the people around here um, live in perfect harmony with nature. Everybody at, at, at Denver um, is a transformative individual. Um, we've all been living for centuries in harmony with the buffalo corn and the spork whale up, up in the mountains uh, in Colorado. Um, but imagine what would happen um, if something threatened the spork whale or, or the buffalo corn um, intrinsic to the Colorado economy. Um, could, could you imagine a scenario like that? That would be horrible. It would be absolutely the worst thing in the world. Can, can you adjust a, a little bit better? Oh, yeah, how's that? So that what, what could happen uh, to an economy if something uh, cataclysmic like that uh, that would cause the, the economy to, to come out of balance? Well, I mean, the, the economy actually fundamentally runs on... Uh, ecology essentially but most people don't even think about it uh, when you think about what civilization is it's civilization right now as we know it is based on uh, agriculture plus uh, money essentially and so an agriculture fundamentally is uh, allowing us to transform ecosystems in order to create uh, the supply chains that humans require in order to run civilization so if the buffalo corn and the spork whales disappeared, we might not be able to run agriculture anymore. Have we experienced anything like this before in, in human history, maybe in outside of Colorado? Well, yeah, actually, uh, so when we think about uh, the arc of human history, um, you know, we were actually forced into agriculture as a result of the Younger Dryas. And so when we have massive perturbations in ecology, it forces us to uh, adapt in really unique ways. Um, and I think the risk that's in front of us right now from a Regen Ag perspective, um, I'm not sure if you've seen this, but in Scientific American, they're saying there's about 60 crop cycles left on planet Earth. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of alarm bells that are going off on what, what does it actually mean for us to continue to have uh, a supply chain, specifically food and water, um, in light of some of these liabilities that are, are right in front of us right now. Thank you. So, um, Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, one of the, the greatest minds, thinkers, philosophers uh, on the planet, uh, sense maker uh, in a sense, or, or uh, this doesn't make sense pointer outer. Um, uh, he's, he's pointed out uh, uh, that essentially we're, we're operating um, with a, an exponentially growing financial economy, uh, which drives um, our economy, uh, our real economy, uh, far too hard and, and far too hot. And, and essentially, um, this exponential economy um, is driving uh, what could be a, a more linear, more balanced, more circular uh, economy even um, to produce waste, uh, essentially, at, at exponential rates. Um, Mark. You want to run with that? Yeah, so, you know, D Daniel talks about the third attractor, right? And the fact that we're kind of um, right now stuck between two options, which is either increased centralization or uh, anarchism, right? And I think the answer really is uh, progressive decentralization. So it's the continuation of this mission of progressive decentralization across all levels. Um, I think in the crypto space, we've been focused so far heavily on 
self-custody of bits, so digital assets and, uh, and data. And uh, we are now starting to move more into self-custody of atoms, which really means physical infrastructure. And uh, the good news is that there are so many solutions out there uh, that allows us to go in that direction. So you think about regenerative agriculture, and I think Rob can, can talk more about this, distributed energy systems, uh, water systems. These are all solutions that can enable communities and individuals uh, to have ownership over and, and self-custody over their food, energy, and water. And um, it's, it's interesting because um, I sometimes wish we have uh, some technology incentive layer that can enable coordination at scale. Do you know something about that? Um, I, I've been doing some reading recently, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I heard the term Web3 and crypto maybe or something like that. So. Um, if we can start build those networks, right, of autonomous communities that have self-custody over food, water, energy, data assets, so both bits and atoms, we can really usher from the paradigm of linear extractive economies uh, where basically, you know, users have an adverse relationship with businesses to an economy that is more regenerative, uh, circular, resilient, even anti-fragile and basically uh, allow us to generate positive externalities and solve a lot of those negative externalities that, that we're dealing with today. And so at Fifth World, we call this basically regenerative living or regenerative network states. If, if you want to go a little deeper on, on some of that, uh, I, I do recommend listening to Kevin Owaki's podcast, Green Pill. Um, he had a three-parter three parter with Daniel Schmachtenberger. I, Look up Schmachtenberger, it's exactly how it sounds, it's spelled exactly how it sounds. Um, but uh, it was uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely essential um, synthesis um, of thinking about our own decentralized protocol ecosystem and, uh, and what, what Daniel speaks about all the time. Um, so fortunately, I, I feel like we're, um, we're in a transition, and the transi transition is accelerating. The, the paradigm shift is decidedly on. Uh, transitions are hard. Hopefully, this one uh, won't be so difficult. Uh, this super cycle's ending. Um, how do we get to the next super cycle? What, is, what, what does transition look like, Michelle? So you're asking how, what it's going to look like to transition to this regenerative economy? I would love to hear yeah. what, what you're seeing in yeah. terms of the business or yeah, well, uh, di different systems with respect to <laughs> land, yeah. uh, energy, yeah, water. I'd say yeah. you, can, you can certainly attest that any time you want to go against entrenched interests and existing structures, it's difficult, right? And um, we can think about you know, this space, this Web3 space and the crypto space in the last 10 years, and I'm you know, there's this top-down model where you've got authority, monopolies, or gatekeepers. And in this space, you guys have been working really hard in building tools to, to have bottom-up solutions and bottom-up models. And we essentially need to, um, well, those top-down centralized systems repeat, whether we're talking about energy systems, like how do, we, how do we, you know, power this building, or how do we supply water, or how do we get food? It's all top-down centralized control, and there's very little bottom-up thinking and bottom-up solutions. So the, ch the challenge is big, because you've seen, you know, it's taken 10 years, and I think if we went back 10 years ago and asked people in this room, how, how easy is it going to be to transform the financial system, um, there would be many people saying, oh my gosh, it's going to be really difficult, it's going to be really hard. And I don't want to downplay how Guess difficult what? it's been. <laughs> but 10 years later, I think maybe the mood is different. And, I, and, I, and I'm excited about we're now facing the same challenge in these other systems. And so that, that gives me tons of optimism in terms of how, um, how we can do the same thing. And we can also leverage all these tools, systems, processes, learnings from the Web3 community. And I feel like that will help us accelerate this transition to regenerative economies. So, yeah. Yeah. so early on, we used to say decentralize all the things, tokenize all the things. Um, maybe we should take a step back and figure out how we uh, regenerate all the things or decentralize and regener regenerate all the things. What, what is regenerative ag? What, what have you and Michelle been doing uh, for, for the last uh, many years uh, in, in your practice? Do you want to take that? 
Yeah, for the last 15 years, we uh, actually, I'm going to go back a little bit further. So I'm actually a petroleum engineer. So I started off in the oil and gas industry in the belly of the giant, Calgary, Alberta. Um, I was the guy that was bringing natural gas and fossil fuel to your cars and natural gas to your homes to heat it and felt really conflicted about uh, how could I criticize the very industry that I was supporting as a consumer? And so I called my wife up one day after watching a three-minute video of this guy who was regenerating a, a piece of desert uh, in the lowest place on earth, Dead Sea Valley, uh, with very few resources. And, uh, and I was about ready to cut down a massive swath of forest in order to bring a new natural gas pipeline in. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? So being an engineer and a complete nerd, I took my calculator out of my pocket. I calculated out how many hours of life energy I have on this earth. And I said, it's about 600,000 and I've burned through a third of them. How do I want to spend the next two thirds of my life? So I quit my job. I encouraged Michelle to quit her job too. And we traveled around the world looking for positive solutions. And uh, we've been teaching that for the last 15 years through a system called permaculture. And we've transformed thousands of people's lives around the planet. Um, and what's super exciting about it is actually the issues that we're talking about today are not technical issues. It's a social issue. We have all the tools, we have all the resources, we have all the knowledge to regenerate planet Earth rapidly, but we're lacking a coordination layer, and I'm not sure where we should find that. Yeah, I'm still wondering. I know we've been doing some readings about uh, Web3, but... Um. Just, yes, just to add to that uh, a little bit, like the way I, get, I got into regenerative agriculture was uh, through chatting with Joe. And I remember Joe um, shared with me a very cool documentary to watch. I think it's called The Biggest Little Farm. And, I, and you know, my background was in crypto economics and I've done a lot of like uh, token designs and like interesting systems designed around how to use tokens and incentives. And then I watched this documentary and this was basically the exact same type of thinking, but in real life. Like I, I was watching those people actually just creating life by thinking through how they can build a symbiotic ecosystem. And then it just clicked, like what if we can use all those experiments, all those currency, currency experiments, monetary experiments that we're doing in crypto, incentives experiments, and connect them somehow to regeneration, to agriculture, to food, energy, and water, we'll be able to usher into a whole new paradigm and a whole new economy. And one thing, one, one comparison I really like to, to, to talk about a lot is the same way nature needs biodiversity, I think our society today needs monetary diversity. We need uh, to create money that is linked to specific purposes that allow us to become resilient to financial crisis and uh, resilient to linear and extractive systems. Awesome. So uh, Michelle and or Rob, um, can you describe what a recirculating agricultural sort of living ecosystem might be. So as opposed to some sort of factory farm thing, uh, which is um, essentially robbing the land uh, of nutrients um, and destroying the land. Um, what, does a, what does a recirculating farm um, that is essentially uh, in harmony with itself and in harmony with uh, people like yourselves, what does that look like? So the, the best example that we have of this, one of the best examples, is what was actually occurring on the eastern seaboard of the United States before uh, Europeans came here. There was close to 30 million indigenous people uh, living on that seaboard, and there were no signs of what we call agriculture today. In, fa in fact, we now know that they were actually uh, using a form of agriculture, but it's more of a syntropic agroforestry system. Uh, where they were basically living off of the byproducts of perennial plants, plants that you plant once and they continue to grow. And so we know that the, the short answer to your question, Joe, is nature. Nature provides all it's of... It's called nature. It's called it's nature. Already, right? And a a agriculture, in a way, for the last 10,000 years, has essentially been at war with nature. So we've been uh, following the same pattern of deforesting, plowing, and desertifying. And... The problem is, is that uh, we, we had very short human lives and so we were unable to understand the feedback that, uh, of the damage that we were creating essentially. And so um, I believe now that we can merge with technology in a way that allows us to uh, take all the democratized sensors that are showing up on the market and we can essentially create a whoop for planet Earth. 
Uh, Whoop, this little device right here that I wear has been transforming the way that I interact with my environment. When I go to sleep, what I eat, I can get instantaneous feedback on um, what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis so that I can course correct and become a healthier human being. We have all the technology now to do that. And so Fifth World is starting to integrate those pieces together into a unified MRV system that will allow humans to have a better understanding of what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so our thesis is that humans are not inherently destructive, we just lack feedback. And I believe that we will, the, the system that will allow us to essentially create these new supply chains that are work in harmony with nature can be worked out and sorted out once we have the right data and the right dashboards at our fingertips that allow us to make better decisions. I have another example, um, like taking this bottom-up solutions. What does that actually mean in the, in the realm of water? Because that's one of my areas of expertise. So traditionally, um, communities or municipalities, when they're trying to provide water to their community, they think we need a top-down centralized solution, right? We need to build a massive water treatment plant. We need to pull water from a river and then build, build one network of pipes to deliver that water to all these houses and these communities, and we just turn the tap on, right? And yet, um, better, better tools like big data and systems analysis has actually shown us that it's a much more uh, resilient system to have more local supply. So have individual houses with rainwater, for example, or have those homes uh, manage their own stormwater instead of send that stormwater straight to sink. And so we need more of that bottom-up local solutions in the same way that, you know, again, Web3 allows peer-to-peer -peer transactions. We need more local local energy, we need more local water, we need more local food systems, we need more bottom-up, and not only relying on top-down centralized control. Yeah. So a lot of the time people ask me if I think things are going well in our ecosystem. Um, is this what I expected? Uh, and generally that's a big yes. Um, it, I'm amazed at, uh, at how little resistance, despite all the resistance that, that we've encountered, I, I'm amazed at how little resistance really uh, we've encountered, um, given the vested interests uh, on the planet. Um, they've woken up quite significantly, um, and the attacks will continue. Maybe they will intensify, uh, maybe not. Um, but the bottom line is that we've built um, these amazing systems, decentralized protocols, uh, interacting um, modular components, a, a, a whole new vision uh, for a system of the world, a new system of the world uh, that's profoundly decentralized, but it's all sitting up here on somebody else's clouds. Uh, it's, all, it's all running on fundamental infrastructure um, that we could get bumped off of. Um, so, and I'm talking about compute infrastructure, and yes, there is some real de decentralized compute infrastructure. Uh, there's solo stakers, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm talking about land, uh, I'm talking about food, I'm talking about water, I'm talking about energy in its various different forms, I'm talking about legal systems. And recently I've been talking to uh, various builders and um, yes, investors and other people about uh, um, what we can do about it. It's a coordination problem. Uh, we need to form, I think, giant pools of capital uh, and go out and figure out how to, how to uh, ground all this that we're building in, in fundamental substructure. Uh, and so um, that's, that's a big um, project and, and this is, uh, I, I think, a, a really interesting part of, of that big project. Um, it might need a manifesto. This project might need a manifesto. Uh, Mark, if, if this project had a manifesto, what, what would some of the elements <laughs> of, of that project be? Yeah, only if it had a manifesto. Um, so you used the word builder in there, and, and I like this term because I think uh, for a long time we've been using this word to mean developers, but in, in, in our company and you know, in, in our network, we use this term to actually mean creators, contributors, makers, right? People who are actually building physical infrastructure. And I think we need to keep promoting that and keep building those builder communities. And so if we look at the, at the current paradigm that we're under, it's a paradigm of you know, growth above everything else and 
we love growth, we love evolution, and we want to grow. But at the same time, we are dealing with a lot of negative externalities coming from only thinking about growth. And so what we also focus on is how do we grow in an anti-fragile way, in a way that instead of generating negative externalities can generate positive externalities. And, and for us, we really think, you know, we are at a stage right now in our human evolution where we're kind of ushering into the next stage. I think, Joe, you call it the super cycle. And, you know, it's, it's exciting, right? But it's also a challenge. And I think, in, in my opinion at least, the biggest challenge is how do we do that in a way that allows us to build a regenerative, harmonious relationship between technology, humanity, and nature. And then, if we're able to figure that out, this will usher us into basically decentralized acceleration instead of just effective acceleration. I love effective acceleration. I think technology is a key part of human evolution and a key part of humanity. But at the same time, if we can grow and accelerate in a decentralized way, we'll be basically growing in, more, in a more resilient and anti-fragile way and in a more positive way. So we know that, the, coming back to your Schmuckenberger piece, that the first and the second attractor are not places that we want to go. And I loved how Schmuckenberger said, uh, the third attractor is some place we want to be, but we don't necessarily know how to build it completely. But the brains in this room, I, I can almost guarantee, can figure that out. And this is where uh, the VDAO is going to play a really important role to bring all those pieces together. Yeah. So, Michelle, what, what does Fifth World do? Uh, does it have products? Does it have services? What roles do the members uh, of Fifth World, how many people are in Fifth World? How what roles do they perform? Fifth World is about uh, regenerative living, like tools for regenerative living, right? So we do a lot, and that's why it's a little bit difficult to put in one little nugget. But let's say if it touches um, sustainability and regenerative living, we have a play there. We teach courses. We um, or we have we just launched can you, a DAO. Can you talk about? Uh, right? So there's a, a mm -hmm. Verge Permaculture yeah. Group. Uh, yeah, what, we what teach courses, courses in sustainability, yeah. rainwater design passive solar greenhouses, permaculture design, gardening, all of that stuff. All those just like hands, touch grass, hands in the dirt, skills that your grandmother didn't teach you. Yeah. Um, so that's the education side. I could probably pass it on to Mark. Mark's yeah. got the <coughs> crypto side. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So Fifth World basically builds, designs and builds actually, uh, anti-fragile and regenerative food, water, and energy systems. We've been doing that for individuals. We've been doing that for communities. Uh, we have an education arm that educates people on how to do it themselves, and there's a, a lot of people interested in that. And recently, we launched this DAO to really figure out how can we use Web3 to coordinate and also innovate. And so part of BDAO is really bringing in the crypto community with the region, ag, and permaculture community into one place, uh, enabling discussions, interactions, and even ideating solutions in the physical and digital world that can usher us into this decentralized regenerative uh, paradigm. So if you want to know more, uh, we do have a happy hour later today, and I really encourage you all to, to go and uh, talk to us. So, so you all have products like greenhouses, designs for, <laughs> for things like eco-villages, consultants that go out and, and work very hands-on or, or just uh, in indicatively, instructively uh, with people. Um, what other, if, if there were to be a DAO, uh, a, a VDAO, uh, indeed, but uh, how, like, what sorts of roles uh, could people take on um, in Fifth World DAO? Yeah, <clears throat> so there, there's a bunch of roles. Uh, we basically have three goals uh, behind launching the DAO. One goal is enabling community interaction and community discussion in virtual, in the virtual space, but also in the, in the real world having real world meetups, uh, having uh, supper clubs. Uh, there's a cool uh, uh, slow food movement that Rob was telling me about uh, that we want to also bring into the crypto ecosystem. Another big goal of ours is really uh, creating high tech, high nature, high touch pop-up experiences. So uh, we've been following Zuzalu and we've been following the work that has been going on there and really want to bring in the agriculture and food and energy piece into it. And the last piece is we're going to be running some ideatons around it eating solutions, some very cool competitions, uh, you know, not to convey a lot of details, but meme related. So follow us and uh, you'll get to know more. Cool. So to wrap us up, uh, five words each on what's most exciting to you about what's going on in your work or, or in Fifth World. Mark? Five words, maybe more. 
community? Turned our mics off. Oh no, they didn't. <laughs> uh, being here and connecting with um, this this community yeah, is really exciting awesome. to me. Yeah. yeah. So I'm really stoked about our MRV project. So if Ethereum is the world computer, uh, the work we're doing in MRV is, is essentially creating the Whoop for Planet Earth. Whoop for Planet Earth. Five words. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. That's great. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. This is a, a world that needs to exist, a world that I want to live in, and we need to. Next up, we have.